good to see you guys. So before we get started here, I'd love to open us up in prayer. And uh, actually for you Facebook folks, uh, thanks for joining us. We appreciate you guys uh, joining us online. Um, definitely hit like and share, even you guys here. If you want to pull your phones out, you can hit like and share on Facebook and YouTube. And a uh, great way to spread the news. Uh, so I wanted to open us up in prayer and a little bit before I pray, uh, my sister-in-law is, today was her original due date for the baby, and uh, so uh, they, I think they changed it to uh, June 28th. So the baby's past due or on time, but not here yet, so I would definitely want to lift her up in prayer this morning before we get started and, uh, and just hope everything goes smooth. So Father God, thank you so much for uh, gathering us here this morning, Lord. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to come and just worship you as a family, Lord. And uh, Father, we lift up Sammy as a uh, baby is on the way, almost here, Lord. We thank you for this awesome gift. Father, we just pray for a hand of protection around her, a hand of protection around her husband, Lord, a hand of protection around the baby. And Lord, just pray for wisdom and guidance for the doctors as they, uh, as they help Sammy and get the baby here. Father God, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Would you stand with us this morning? church. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's give Jesus a clap this morning, church. Amen. Come on. Romans 8.35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness 
or danger or sword. Verse 37 through 39 goes on to say that, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a great reason to say hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> all right. Golden strength is gone. You're the one who pulls me on. You are the light, you are the fight that's in my soul. Oh, your resurrection power burns like fire in my heart. When waters rise, I lift my eyes up to your throne. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror.
Thank you, Lord, for the victory you've given us in Christ. Amen. If you guys want to take a moment, you can definitely uh, greet each other and welcome each other this morning. I see some new faces, so don't be bashful. Oh, my soul, and I'll worship your home. 
Lord, we do lift high your holy name here in this place this morning. Jesus, we thank you that although you are holy, you are perfect, and you are pure, Lord, you decided to send your son Jesus to those who are completely unholy and completely impure. And Jesus, by your blood, you have cleansed us, you have purified us, Lord. And so, Lord, we, we stand with deep respect and honor for who you are, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for giving your life for us on the cross of Calvary, Lord. For paying the price that we could not pay so that we may receive your grace, Lord. We thank you for that this morning, Jesus. I'd like to invite you at this time. We're going to take communion together. And if you received a, a cup on the way in, you can grab it. It has both the wafer and some juice within it. If you didn't, if you'd want to slip your hand up and our ushers will... Uh, get one to you. We'll make sure you are able to join if you would like to participate with us. So can you imagine being Jesus surrounded by his best friends on this earth? And you're about to tell them that you're going to go and give your life for them. And the meal you're going to partake in is representing his body and his blood. You know, they did not fully appreciate, they did not fully understand the gravity of the situation. But Jesus knew. He knew what the cost would be. And he, he still willingly chose to go to the cross. And you know what, church? He did it for me, and he did it for each one of us. Amen? And his sacrifice, his atonement, is enough not to just cover part of our sin, but all of our sin. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Isn't that good news, church? Amen. It's good news. So, uh, Paul recalls in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, For I pass unto you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's go ahead and partake of the way for representing his body. Lord Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, that Although this is a little way for God, it, it represents something so much deeper. The scars that you took, the bruises, the battering, the beating, the crown of thorns, the nails in your hand. Lord, and, and it's just amazing to me that we can take that as a personally to each one of us, that you did this for each one of us, Lord. God, we are so grateful for something that we have never deserved. We thank you for it, Lord. It says, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, giving thanks. He said, this is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's go ahead and partake of the juice part of this again. Lord, we just celebrate you today, once again, even as... We celebrate our nation's independence. That's a small thing compared to the sacrifice that you made for us, Lord. And Jesus, we thank you that we are part of a kingdom because of you that's even greater than our nation. But we are grateful for this place you've given us as well, God. And we pray for healing in our land, Lord. Lord Jesus, your blood provides for our healing. And so, God, we pray for your healing touch, your healing power to be upon this nation once again, Lord. Father, we pray that injustices would be made right and, and chaos would end. And Father, that your will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And we stand together in agreement in that today. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I come I confess 
My side's wrong, my side's right. Lord, I just pray that you just come in the middle of that. That the only one that's going to win the argument is Satan, Lord. That you are the only truth, not us. Father God, I just pray for peace in our nation, Lord. I pray for mending in our nation. Lord, I pray for the, the leaders of our nation. Father God, that you would just infiltrate the house and let that shine, Father God. Yes. Father God, I pray for your people this morning. I pray for your church. We just pray a, a blessing over the sermon this morning as Ryan's going to get up here and speak, Lord. In your name we pray all this. Amen. Yeah, you may be seated. Good morning, church, and good morning to those of you joining us online as well. So glad to have all of you here, both online and in person. I would like to make a quick announcement. If you are joining us here in church or online for the first time, please take a moment on our website or through our app to fill out our Connect card. We would love to get to know you better. And it's just, oh, and we have a free gift. Also, Women's Night. Women are having a cameo night tomorrow night here at the church starting at 6.30, and we would love for all of you women to join us. Um, just bring a lawn chair, and if you have a favorite yard game that you'd like to play, you can bring that as well. Also, Next Steps starts next week. 
So if you are newer to the church or you've been here a while and never taken the Next Steps class, we would love to have you. It's a great opportunity to connect with others inside the church and learn a little bit more about the church as well. It's a four-week class, and there's a sign-up on the welcome table. And, oh, youth. If we have any youth in the room, or if you know of any youth, we're going to have a youth event up at Country Faith Church, July 26th and 27th. We're going to drive up and back both days. So we'll be leaving the church at noon, and we'll be back around 10. Um, registration and all the info for that is on the welcome table as well. Otherwise, thanks for joining us. Oh, children, ages 18 months to fifth grade can come with me. All right, kiddos, there's your sign. Enjoy. Welcome, everyone. Great to see you here today. It's good to be with God's people on July 5th. I hope you enjoyed fireworks and celebrations yesterday. Uh, we had a good time at my parents' place on the lake and um, got to enjoy some fireworks and, and family time, so it was good. Welcome also to those watching online. Good to have you here with us this morning. Uh, we are continuing on in a series that I have called Meat Eaters, and it's all about the idea that as Christians, we have different stages of growth when we're new in Christ, and uh, we're, we're just excited about uh, being forgiven and the grace that God has pour it out to us. The Bible encourages us to crave pure spiritual milk. And so in that time, uh, it's so fun because you can see people who are just coming alive to Jesus and they're just taking in everything that they possibly can. And I think that is awesome, right? Like, like go online, listen to as much good teaching as you can get. Um, get in as much worship as you can. Read your Bible and I pray that those things don't change. But as we mature as Christians, it says that we are to go beyond just drinking milk and getting deeper into the nourishment of the word. And the scripture uses the term solid food. And in one version it says solid meat, which of course I love because I love me some meat and some bacon and just good stuff. So it's our meat eater series. And uh, also I, I tried to get on the keto diet with my wife and it's all meat products basically. So... God is good. There's a diet with meat products. Come on. All that said, our goal is that we begin as a church to uh, dig deeper into God's word and the theology. The difference between eating milk and eating meat is you have to use a fork and a knife to eat meat, right? So we have to take a little bit of a deeper dive together. And so that's our goal during this series, that we would take a deeper dive, um, not only personally, but in church as well. So this morning, uh, we're going to be talking about the doctrine of evil, the doctrine of evil. And doctrine is just a word that means everything that the Bible says about a particular topic. So this morning, we're going to be talking about the doctrine of evil in this world. Um, and theology, and it sounds like a big, big, heady word, but it literally just means the study of God. Theos is God, ology is study. So we're studying God, and it's a good thing to study God. And, and we have a little saying that's going along with this series. Solid theology leads to a solid faith, which applied leads to a solid life. Now, it's one thing to have um, a solid theology. It's another thing to apply it. Unfortunately, there are like Bible scholars who have, know everything about the Bible, but have not always lived it. And that's about the worst tragedy there is. On the flip side, we see a lot of Christians that are living life for the Lord, have relationship with the Lord, but maybe don't have that steady foundation in the, in the scripture. And that's where having a solid theology comes in. So it's our hope that, that we grow in our theological understanding and who God is and his nature and his character and attributes. And so that's what this series is all about. It's, it's our goal that you would um, just kind of get your appetite whetted with diving deeper into the word of God and his character. And a part of this series, we've also been doing a reading through the book of Proverbs. And we're doing four chapters at a time. This past week, uh, if you're following along with us, you would have read chapters 9 through 12. And we're asking different people from the church to come and just share um, some ideas that God showed to you while you were studying or something that stuck out to you from the pages as you've studied. And so sharing that with us this morning is our brother Dave Isarut. So Dave, would you come on up? Let's give Dave a clap.
And Dave expressed to me that he was nervous. So, you know, I don't know why, but <laughs> let's pray for Dave. Father, I would thank you, Lord, for my brother Dave. God, I just thank you, Lord, that he is a man of depth and a man of the word. And I know that. And I pray, God, that you would just uh, allow the right words to come forward as you share this morning. In Jesus' name. Good morning, church family and church family online. Um, uh, Proverbs Proverbs is a book that was written by Solomon, King Solomon, um, which he was the wisest man to ever live. And and chapters nine through twelve deal with uh, deal with a thing that we don't necessarily really think about anymore, and that's wickedness versus righteousness. Um, uh, wickedness could be substituted for the word sin as well, um, uh, and and righteousness. You know, we all know is is uh, the right standing with God. Um, uh, uh, who here? Um, uh, uh, there's a couple of scriptures that stuck out to me. Um, uh, in the book of Proverbs, one of them is in chapter. Uh, actually, two of them are in chapter ten, which, um, which, uh, which shows the difference between righteousness and wickedness, uh, and their consequences. Uh, verse. 16, uh, chapter 10, verse 16, uh, it says, uh, the, la the labor of the righteous leads to life. Uh, the activity of the wicked leads to sin. And then in verse 19, it says, when, when there are many words, sin, sin is unavoidable, but the one who controls his lips is wise. Um, um, I guess, um, I guess uh, those, uh, those uh, really stuck out to me because because if God is serious about something, he says it in the Old Testament, but he also reverts it into the New Testament. Um, um, so, um, so if um, in, in, in Galatians chapter 5 uh, shows, us, shows us the different, um, or what sin is and what righteousness, what righteousness is, so, uh, so if you could turn with me to Galatians chapter five, whether you uh, have a Bible or a Bible app. Uh, it starts in verse nineteen, five, verse nineteen. Uh, uh, now the now the works of the flesh are obvious: sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry. Sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. Uh, I tell you that the things um, about these things in advance, as I told you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control against such things there is no law and and um, and you know I don't think that we really will consider anything wicked anymore um, um, because um, because you know it says uh, uh, in the book of revelations that that in the end days uh, evil will be good and good will be evil and and that's just you know some of the things that I got from from chapters nine through twelve. Thank you, Dave. Good job, brother. Yeah, I think that's a really important point to make. In that, uh, no one really does point out sin anymore, right? And if it's good for you, it's good for the world, and it's not true. Like not true biblically it's not true practically like it, eventually someone's sin is going to step on someone else's toes and god calls it sin so it's wrong so i appreciate how they brought out that those proverbs really do point out that there's a path of the righteous and there is a path of the wicked and both have consequences 
So that was very good. Thank you, Dave. Um, I want to continue on and a little bit different from wickedness, but the idea of evil in this world. And I want to start by saying this. We wouldn't know what is evil if we didn't know what is good first. We wouldn't know what is evil if we didn't know what is good first. In reality, number one in the discussion of evil is that good that we do know came from God. The good that we do know has come from God. So many people want to call God to account for the evil in this world. They are experiencing evil, they're going through evil, they're seeing evil, and they assign blame to God for that evil. God, why would you allow that to happen to me? God, why did my relative get COVID-19 and die? God, why did that accident happen? And it's, it's, it's probably natural for us to, to want to point to God if we, if we believe there's a higher power. If we, it's funny, people say, I don't believe in God, but then when something bad happens, they blame God, right? But ultimately, we wouldn't know that there is, that there is evil or a corruption of good unless we first knew that there was good. And that good, according to James, is from God. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. You know, some of us lost trees in the storm this past week. We got some pretty good straight-line winds blowing through town on Wednesday and took out some good trees. And, you know, you might have had a really nice tree. And you're like, God, why did that happen to me? <laughs> and, and, and the reality is, you wouldn't know that you had lost something and first you, unless you first had that something and enjoyed that tree and enjoyed the blessing of it in your yard or, or whatever it is. It's the same way. And, and, and so we wouldn't know that there's evil if we didn't know that there was good. And so it's the same way in, in bigger issues of life. You know, those, and heaven forbid, but those who have lost children, even at a young age, Right? We wouldn't know it's evil unless we knew how amazingly good it was. And that good is from God. And so in the discussion of evil, we need to start there. That, that all of the good we enjoy in this life has been a gift from our Father in Heaven. And, and why do we go first to blaming God when we can go first and say, God, you are good. Thank you. Reality number two is that we actually don't deserve anything good, right? We don't deserve anything good. Anything good that comes to us is a gift from God. As humanity, we've basically given the author of life and the creator of all that is good nothing short of treason. When Adam and Eve took that fruit uh, that, that uh, God said, you will not eat from that tree, Satan came up to Eve and said, God is holding out on you. Don't you know that if you eat that fruit, you'll be like him? God's trying to trick you. He's holding out on you. As a matter of fact, if you take that fruit, you will be like God. And don't we see that all around us, that everyone wants to be their own God. They don't want to submit to a greater God. They want to be their own God. And so it's the same trick that the enemy used thousands of years ago to trick Adam and Eve that he uses for us today. He holds out something and he promises freedom. Maybe it's that next bottle of whatever. Maybe it's that next hit. Maybe it's that um, arrogance of standing up to your boss and saying, enough with you, I'm out of here. Whatever it is, the enemy tempts us with it, promises freedom, says, God's holding out on you if you don't partake of this. And then we take the fruit, so to speak, and guess what we're left with? We're not free. We're filled with fear, shame, and guilt. Same trick, thousands of years old. The Bible says that we need to be aware of the scheme of the devil. And that's his number one scheme, is to convince us that God isn't good, that God is deceiving us, and that somehow we're missing out on something greater. <laughs> when... I like how Dave read from Galatians 5. Those things are just clearly sin. They're not going to bring us the freedom that we think we will enjoy. And so, as people, we do not deserve anything good from God. Generally speaking, towards humanity, we have given God a sign that we don't want anything to do with Him. 
And Romans 1, verses 18 and 19 says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people. That's right, there is wickedness. And God's wrath is coming for it soon. And he will come and make things right. His wrath will be poured out. It says it's coming against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. Romans 2.5 also confirms, But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Church, what we really deserve from God is wrath. But what we have received from God through Jesus is truly amazing grace. Truly amazing grace and mercy and favor and blessing and goodness. I don't know about you, but I got to go out on a lake yesterday. It was a wonderful experience. I love nature. I love being outside. I love hunting and fishing. And we live in a, it's, even though we have struggles, we live in a great place. We deserve wrath, but God has given us so much good. And, and we should celebrate that. And that's, that's the, the second part of this, is the idea that uh, we don't deserve anything good, but God gives us good in return. And yet, we do suffer and deal with things in life that are very difficult to deal with, right? Like the loss of a child or, or you know, being fired unexplainably or, or COVID-19, right? These are things that were like, what is going on? Why is this going on in the world? Why is God allowing this? And the argument that the world uses, and unfortunately often Christians use, goes something like this. If God is good, why does he allow suffering and evil? And if God is all-powerful, couldn't he end all suffering and evil? He chooses not to, therefore God isn't good or he doesn't even exist. Right? Isn't that what we hear in the world? God could end all evil. If he was good, he would do it. And it is tempting as a Christian to be like, well, that's a pretty solid argument. <laughs> you know, how come God doesn't just end all things that are evil? And the thing that we're not factoring in is what I've touched on already is, is, is that God has given people choice. God has given us free choice. And so often we choose against what is good. And because the world is corrupted by sin, by the sin of others, by our own sin, and by even sin corrupting nature itself, there is evil in this world. Now God could say, enough, no more evil, no more free choice. But then would God be good? And the answer is no. If we were all robots, I would say that would take God's goodness to a lower level. Right? God isn't an evil dictator in the sky telling us what to do. Even being a, quote, good dictator would not be like God. He gives us free choice and free will to either serve him or not serve him, to do good or to do evil. And so a lot of what we see in this world, you can literally sum up with this idea. There is sin in the world, right? I mean, it's kind of trite. It's a little, uh, you know, cliche, but there is a greater truth behind that. Like even why, why do plants and, and certain things not come to their fruition? Why do things die prematurely? Why do we die prematurely? Why do good people suffer? Why are children killed in freak accidents? I mean, that, that's got to be about the worst. Why does that happen? Well, there, there is literally sin in this world. And, and if God said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it all right now, ultimately it would take away our choice. And, and that's something God isn't willing to do. And so he permits these things to happen. It's the idea of his permissive will. That within God's will, there's an area where he allows it to happen, even though he's not excited about it happening, right? Like our God is full of love and grace and compassion. And we wonder, why, why don't you just deal with it, Lord? You know, why is there children who starve? And, and why are there still murderous dictators? And why do these things still happen? And again, it, it boils down to our choice. Humans, humans have really... Uh, messed it up. <laughs> and we could say, why doesn't God just create, why didn't he just create a world where there was no evil and no suffering to begin with? 
Well, he did. Right? He did. But he also made the choice for people to choose. He allowed people to choose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they did, unfortunately. And because of that, sin and corruption and decay entered our world. And we deal with that today. So a harder question might be, why does God allow seemingly non-rational accidents and death to occur? What about the stillborn, the freak accidents, even really good people dying from cancer? And for that, I point to the idea that God does indeed see a bigger picture that we do not see. And, and, and it boils down to trust. And I encourage you to go back through your life and say, God, I know you are good. You have proven yourself good to me time and time again. Though I can't see the reasoning behind the situation today, I see you, and I see you're with me, you're active with me. And in fact, church, there will be a day where there will be no more tears, no more crying, no more pain, no more hurt in this world, and all things will be made right. It is very difficult, though, and, and honestly, there's no theology, and there's no apologetic that is going to work great when you have lost someone dear to you. And so I encourage you as, as followers of Jesus to be very careful what you say to someone who has lost someone close. Be very careful not to try to make it a cliche argument. Well, God's going to use it for good. All right, yes, he is, but it's probably not going to make someone feel a whole lot better in the time. Amen? So we need to be careful with what we say, but we can look and say, God, I don't see it. I don't know why this is happening in my life or, or why it's happening around me, but I can trust that you're in control and that you've got goodness in store. And so here's a few thoughts that go along with that. And again, there's nothing that can perfectly explain why God chooses or allows certain things to happen. But here's one thought. God permits evil things to happen he does not promote them. God permits evil things to happen. He does not promote them. In other words, he allows some evil things to go on in this world, but he's not the one uh, sending COVID-19 onto the earth. He's not the one giving your family member cancer. He's not the one causing that freak accident to happen. He has allowed it, but he is not in promotion of it. Does that make sense? A great analogy is this. A parent may permit the pain of an operation in order to save the life of his child without really promoting pain for his child. Does that make sense? A parent may permit the pain of an operation to save the life of his child. If one of my children had a cancerous mass and I knew it was going to be terrible pain for him to go through that surgery, guess what? I'm still going to send him into surgery because I know ultimately it's going to save his life. In the same way, God uses all things to fulfill his purposes and even uses evil for his glory and for our good. He just does. He knows how to turn things and use them for our good. And uh, I'll pick up my dad. He's here with us today, and it's a miracle he's here with us today. We just about lost him. And, uh, you know, I don't know why my dad got cancer. He's an amazing man. He loves Jesus. But I do know that God is going to use that evil in his life for a lot of good. And he already has. And we've grown in faith as a family, and we've healed some relationships in our family. And God is just so good about permitting, using that terrible situation to bring about blessing and healing and ultimately honor for his great name. I love the history of Joseph. Joseph was the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the first that God said, come to me, I'm going to build a nation out of you. And so Joseph was a descendant and a man of faith. And uh, Jacob, his dad, loved Joseph more than all of his other brothers, Bible teachers. If you want to mess up your family, play favorites. Just saying, it's in the Bible, okay? So they had some real issues going on. Jacob gave Joseph a multicolored, beautiful robe, and uh, his brothers were jealous. 
and God gave Joseph some dreams that made his brothers even more jealous. And so one day they took Joseph and they threw him into a cistern and then they decided what should we do? Should we kill him or should we sell him? Well, ultimately they were a little gracious. One of them stood up and said, no, 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 let's not kill him, let's sell him. <laughs> Thanks, brother. So they sold him and some traders ultimately resold him to Potiphar, who was the head, the captain of the guard in Egypt, um, one of Pharaoh's uh, bodyguards, if you will. And while Joseph was there, like, Joseph's story is so cool because he continues to rise in every situation he's placed. In, when, when evil comes his way, it's almost like he says, bring it on. I'm going to just stay faithful to God and I'm going to rise out of this. Well, when he's in Potiphar's home, he becomes in charge of all the other slaves in the household. He's, he's given permission and command over all of the rest of the home except for Potiphar's wife. So he knew Potiphar's wife was out of bounds Potiphar's wife didn't think Joseph was out of bounds. She thought he was pretty good looking. So she tries to lure him into bed one day, grabs his cloak, and Joseph says, uh-uh, I'm out of here. He runs off while she's got the cloak, and, and she says, Potiphar, this guy came and tried to make sport of me. He tried to take advantage of me. And so Potiphar was rightly upset, took Joseph, and threw him into what would have been like Egypt's dungeon, you know, just a bad, bad place. Well, even when he is in the pit of the dungeon, God raises him up, and he becomes like second in command to the master of the, of the jail. And while he's in prison, a couple uh, other people who had done things, um, cupbearer to the king and the baker, they were there with him, and Joseph gave them, they had dreams. Joseph interpreted those dreams. One of the interpretations was that one of them was going to be uh, come before Pharaoh and be put to death because of his crimes. The other was going to be raised up and reinstated into his position of authority in Pharaoh's court. Well, those dreams came true. And uh, so Joseph just said, hey, when you're reinstated, would you remember me? And you know what happened? The guy totally forgot about him. He's still in jail. And, uh, you know, Joseph, he could have at any point said, God, why is this evil happening to me? How dare you allow this evil in my life? But you know, Joseph never once did that. He just kept rising up and rising up and rising up. And he kept his faith in God strong and God kept ele elevating him in spite of all the evil. And then one day, Pharaoh himself had a dream. And ultimately what it meant was that there were going to be seven years of, of uh, great abundance in seven years of terrible famine. And those years of famine were going to eat the years of abundance, all of the produce. And so Pharaoh heard the interpretation to his dream from Joseph. They cleaned Joseph up, brought him out of prison. They, they remember, remembered him then when Pharaoh had his dream. And so they brought him up and, and Joseph interpreted and, and Pharaoh said, this is amazing. Who else in all of Egypt is like you who has the wisdom of God? I'm going to make you my number two. And so only second to Pharaoh, Joseph ruled the entire land of Egypt through evil that God had permitted in his life. Think about that for a second. Is there any situation that God cannot turn around for good? And I love, his brothers came back to visit him one day, and I said, you know, Joseph messed with them a little bit, like he could have really hurt them. I mean, he's the most powerful person in the world, and he's the one who has the food. And His brothers realized, or he revealed himself to his brothers, and it says his brothers came then and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves. Ironic that they sold him as a slave, and they're saying, we're your slave. And Joseph could have rightly said, yes, you are. <laughs> but you know what he said? Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Oh, isn't that good? And I just wonder these days, because these days are evil, what kind of good is going to come out of this? And I believe, church, that there's something good coming out of this. COVID-19, rioting, all this stuff where it just 
Everything seems evil. But I know God is bigger. And He's going to take what the enemy meant for evil, and He is going to turn it for good in this nation, in this world. And maybe these events are leading up to Jesus' return. And that's going to be the ultimate good. It's going to get harder before it gets better. (laughs) I mean, if this is the end, it's going to be harder before it gets better. But there is nothing that God isn't going to turn around and use it for good, whether in this life or the next. So we need to hold on to that church. We need to hold on to that. And in our own lives, you know, Satan, you intended that for evil, but God is using it for good. This, this situation, it was meant for evil, but God's going to turn around and use it for good. And I just believe we can fully trust Him, no matter what evil has come our way, that, that God has a greater purpose, a greater picture. I wish we would see that picture now, but we don't. But God allows these things, He allows these evils to happen. He isn't promoting them. He's not the one sending them. But He's allowing them to happen because He knows that there's a bigger picture. And He will, he will intend what was evil and He'll use it for good. Well, things that happened to Joseph, you know, we shouldn't brush off trouble, we shouldn't brush off people's struggles, what they're, what they're dealing with, their loss. You know, we should love people. But things that happened to Joseph, they were wrong. They were unjust. They were unfair. And we need to acknowledge that. But then we also need to bring in the hope of Christ, that God can take all these things and make them good. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this morning. Lord, we do not know why COVID-19 struck the world. And we do not know why these injustices in our, in our nation were brought to light. And we, we don't know, other than people's sinfulness, why all the chaos and looting is going on, Lord. But Lord, we do know that you are in control. And God, I do pray, God, that you would just bring a a strength and a peace and a security to us as your children. Father, that we would be able to stand strong in these days, now and in the days ahead. Father, we do pray for rights to be wronged, excuse me, wrongs to be righted in our nation, Lord. Father, we pray, Lord, for the social injustice, for the racial injustice that has plagued our nation, God. Father, for how we've treated people. Lord, forgive us of that sin. Father, we pray for righteousness to be reinstated into this place, Lord. There is wickedness. There is righteousness. Father, we pray for an end to the chaos and the the destruction that that people are inciting. Lord, I pray for peace. I pray for peace, peaceful talk, peaceful protest, peaceful ways of bringing about your will, Lord. Father, we just pray, God, for, for a, a healing of our land. Father, I pray for each one of us, God, that has struggled through evil, struggled through suffering, struggled through hardship. Father, that you would just give us a sense of your, of your comfort. Lord, there's no one that can comfort like you can. Father, there's nothing that a person can say that can make some things right. But Lord, you can comfort our hearts. I just pray for a touch of your Holy Spirit on everyone, God, who has been suffering some kind of evil in their life. Lord, I pray for that suffering to end. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would comfort them. And God, every suffering would turn around and be used for good. And I pray that we'd see glimpses of that good in our day, Lord. Lord, we trust you. We trust you. We trust you. Father, help our trust to grow even today, even this 4th of July weekend, Father. We love you, Lord. We thank you, God, for this for this nation that we live in, God. It's still a, a wonderful, great place to live. So, Father, help us to turn our hearts towards you as a nation once again. I bless your people today. I thank you that you love us, God. And you're in control. In the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Amen. Well, be blessed. Really great to see you all today.
Uh, God's peace and comfort be with you and enjoy the rest of your weekend. I hope you've got some good chance to connect with family and the people you love. And if not, maybe you can do that today. So God bless you. We'll see you later.